Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Georgia Smart webinar series. Thank you for joining today. I'm Greg McCormick, director of the Georgia Smart Communities Challenge. Before we get started, a few housekeeping reminders. Please keep your microphone and video muted to eliminate interruptions. This webinar is being recorded and will be available on the Georgia Smart website for viewing later. The websites will also be available for download from our website. Our guest will be answering questions at the conclusion of his presentation, so please use the chat area to submit your written questions. Today's webinar is number six in our, in our webinar series, where we bring you Georgia Tech professors and researchers to discuss ideas and topics in smart communities and the related policy technology and innovation supporting our move toward a technology-driven digital future. We'll be hosting three more webinars at noon throughout the winter and spring of 2020, and those dates are November 14th, January 24th, and April 14th. If you've already joined our subscriber list, thank you. If not, you can join by going to the Georgia Smart homepage, scrolling to the bottom, and filling out the subscriber list form. The website link is on today's is in, in today's chat area. You can check that out. Uh, it's also smartcities.ipat.gotech.edu backslash Georgia-smart. So without further delay, we're very excited to have with us today Professor Ramachandra Siva Kumar, or Siva as he would like you to call him. He's a senior research engineer at Georgia Tech's Center for Spatial Planning and Analytics and Visualization. He has over 20 years of comprehensive experience in GIS and information technology with expertise in web-based GIS application design and development, network and database management, and GIS system administration. He was a contributor in the City of Atlanta's initial enterprise GIS implementation and played a vital role in the development and operation of the Georgia GIS Data Clearinghouse, a spatial data repository for our state. He's a former ESRI certified instructor and runs the ESRI Education Development Center here at Georgia Tech. Steve's presentation today is titled Transforming Today's Cities into Smart Cities, Challenges and Opportunities. Welcome, Siva. Thank you, Greg. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining this webinar today. Um, I appreciate your time. Um, in this presentation today, I would like to kind of go over some of these smart cities initiatives and ideas. Um, I am involved in a smart Georgia project with the Smart Community Challenge initiative with the city of Woodstock. We'll be working on um, Woodstock's ideas on smart city and smart corridor study um, this upcoming year. So this presentation is um, kind of uh, uh, an overview of um, general smart city related um, examples and some opportunities and challenges that uh, you know, we see going forward in the smart city uh, implementation throughout. Um, okay. So before we get started, I just wanted to take a few minutes to talk about our research group at Georgia Tech here and the kind of work that we are involved in. So ours is a um, research group in the College of Design, um, primarily dealing with geospatial technologies, using geospatial technology to address problems in different domains. So I've shown you here some examples, the current work that we are working in the center. Uh, we're working on some mobility-based solutions, uh, looking at uh, um, walking issues uh, for abled and disabled people going from point A to point B, how do you optimize your walking experience, what factors contribute to your decision to take a specific route. So based on research, we've uh, identified certain factors that play a role in a particular individual's decision to going from one place to another. So we've built systems around it, we developed databases around it, and we've created uh, um, uh, mobile applications to uh, help um, navigate that scenario. And then we also have some augmented reality-based applications. Primarily the example that I'm showing you here in the middle of the column there is um, projects that we're working on for our campus. You know, as you see out in our campus, there are a lot of engineering projects that we do 
and that does not get noticed, meaning that you don't you walk by, you don't see it, you don't uh, get a feel for what those projects are and what and these virtual reality and augmented reality application basically help in unearthing some of these applications. So primarily targeting our stakeholders like alumni and past students when they come in, they want to get an immersive experience of our campus so they can kind of look back and what the campus was when they were here and what it is now and so forth. So in the bottom here, I'm showing you some examples of uh, projects that we do in terms of automated detection of built environment features um, using machine learning and artificial intelligence techniques. So this is to help um, uh, inventory um, the surrounding environment, the built infrastructure around us. And then the bottom right, so an example of uh, some payment uh, related data collection. So this is for uh, primarily Georgia Department of Transportation from the payment management perspective. So here we have sensor deployment, high speed data capture, and um, extraction of uh, information to do intervention for uh, perhaps payment management surface treatments or you know understanding the type of cracking they have. So it's like a, um, a, an aid to making decisions on when and where to intervene or how to prioritize uh, the maintenance strategies for the Georgia Department of Transportation. It also involves a lot of pattern recognition, you know, road-based sign uh, uh, inventory extractions uh, into the database as well. In the top right, um, show an example of uh, um, work that one of my colleagues is doing with the Zoo Atlanta and Diane Fassi Corilla Foundation um, Fund in Rwanda. So here we are uh, looking at uh, data collected over the year, 20 year period about uh, the movement of uh, gorillas in the Warunga Mountains of Rwanda. You know, this as a big um, tourist uh, revenue for Rwanda in uh, in the gorilla exhibits there. And um, Diane Fassi, the foundation has an active program in the gorilla preservation. So people, there's a group of researchers and group of, of field personnel who observe these gorilla moments on a daily basis and uh, make records of it. So we have taken uh, 20 years worth of data and kind of visualizing that in a GIS and a 3D environment, what you see there is a is a sand bed that kind of lets you model that terrain and the movement of uh, the gorilla. So, you know, a lot of social uh, interaction, how they behave with each other, the groups, and um, and you know, a lot, a lot of knowledge is being gained by looking at this data uh, over the uh, over the period. So this implementation is in, in Rwanda. Um, we have a similar unit here at Georgia Tech and using as a demonstrative uh, piece in, uh, for our visitors here. And further, uh, we're also doing a lot of work with the city of Atlanta in terms of uh, creating planning and analysis tools or incorporating um, you know, land use, transportation, and environment. As you know, the, our city of Atlanta is growing very rapidly and there are projections for uh, population explosion. So we have to provide and support uh, these new population. So these tools uh, help in create alternative scenarios, study um, how to um, um, you know, plan for the future. And then bottom right, we're looking at the tree canopy assessments for the city to see, you know, our city is known as the city of trees. And uh, this particular project, um, the graphic that I show you is from 2015 and we are in the second phase of that to assess and uh, figure out where our tree canopy stands and that has a lot of implication in the policy related arena in the city of Atlanta. So having said that, um, so this presentation is about our smart city. So before that, we want to know uh, some shifts that have happened globally towards urbanization. So in the past half century or so, we have seen people move from rural to urban areas primarily economic mobility. So people from rural areas tend to go into urban clusters and form uh, you know, cities and the cities grow and um, that's uh, expanding the footprint for uh, what the urban uh, cluster is. And this particular graphic is from United Nations. So not long ago, so less than 50 years ago, only one third of the people lived in urban uh, cities. Um, urban clusters. 
and you only see the three cities of or what they call mega cities and it's a population of greater than 10 million you know one in the united states in the north american continent and two you know in asia like around tokyo uh, um, japan so the trend continues in the mid 20s and within 20 years time frame you know urban population has shifted from being 30 to 45 percent and then you see the number of mega cities so uh, more than 10 of them in, in, in mid 90s and continuing on we are currently at about more than half of us are living in urban environment urban cities and there are 33 are big mega cities they spread across all over the globe as you see here you know it's represented in all continents and that trend is going to continue again in 2030 it projected to be more than 60 percent of the people in the urban clusters and 40 plus cities and classified as mega cities that's in the so when did we cross paths? Uh, it's about mid 2000s. You know, uh, we see the net amount of people, the population shift from rural to urban areas. And the Western countries, like North America and Europe, you always seen the urbanization is long before the rest of the world. The urbanization phenomena is seen. So we see here uh, a trend of moving from rural areas into these towns and cities and forming larger urban clusters. And so this brings with it its own issues of transportation, quality of life, health, environmental issues, and all of these issues compound as we go along. So um, the problems that we face related to these urbanizations. So their you know, solutions are always on the board you know, based on the time period that we're in. But we are at a time right in the technology field. Technology is front and center. If you look at the same time, the leap in technology, you know, the internet has kind of come about starting in the mid 90s, the World Wide Web, and later on the broadband, smartphone evolution, and now LTE, 4G type of services available and social media platforms evolving. So now population, we all are tuned into these technologies and we, we expect to get services, we expect to get things done uh, through our mobile environment or through our computing platforms. So, so this is kind of led to a lot of these efforts towards the smart city initiatives you know, urban areas across the globe have realized that this is an opportunity for taking advantage of this parallel advances in all of these arenas and then bring that into our living environment, urban environment, how to um, um, weave that into the planning process, the designing process, you know, uh, integrating them to, you know, come up with a unified um, solutions for a variety of problems that are that are faced by urban uh, areas today. So the definition of smart city, what is a smart city? You know, it varies depending on who we ask, what segment of the, you know, either industry or a focus group that we ask, you know, the, the definition varies. So I'm listing here three different definitions from three different perspectives. The one on the top is from, is classified as a generic definition in my view from Delight Consulting. It looks at smart city as investments in human and social capital, you know, traditional infrastructure and disruptive technologies that fuel the sustainable economic growth and quality of life. And then in this process, you know, manage the resources that we have and then involve people and governance structures, including all aspects of our day-to-day uh, uh, -day running out of a place. So that is what Delight Cons and a, a smart city. And a technology focused definition from IBM, this is like a few years ago, um, it is looking at interconnected information available today to better understand and operate or optimize our resources. It's basically looking at the connectedness of us and how that plays a big and central role uh, in the smart city aspects of uh, an urban uh, environment. And then um, the one on the bottom is the Manchester Digital uh, Development Agency, a citizen-focused definition. It's smart city means smart citizens, where citizens have all the information that they need to make 
and meaningful informed choices in the place they work and then the um, options they, they choose um, in their day-to-day -day life. So uh, that definition more aligns with what a uh, general public would want to uh, know about a smart city concept. So we talked about this uh, technology playing a, a main role in um, the smart city projects that are being deployed all around. Um, combined with that, you know, we are relying on data that is coming from a variety of different sources. And then how do you use that information effectively and use some analytical methods, derive some new knowledge out of that, and then use that knowledge to perhaps create new policies around it or create new solutions um, to a specific problems that we need to address. So then building that, with the organizational structure that make these things happen. How do you, um, you know, bridge, uh, um, you know, build, a, you know, fast build and foster collaborations, and how do you come up with the innovative ideas and uh, uh, to address these uh, um, problems faced by public at large. And uh, this chart here is how uh, the American Planning Association looks at a smart city. They are largely uh, divided into two groups. There's one as a human systems and the other one is the technology systems. In that human system, you have your, you know, your buildings, your roads, you know, your infrastructure side, and then you have, you know, social side. You know, you have citizen participation, you know, quality of life, and uh, looking at the characteristics of how these social systems evolve. And the technology piece, and you have hardware, software solutions, you know, what type of infrastructure that is available or to support these potential projects that may be coming on board. You know, social media is being used as one of the main sources of, uh, um, you know, getting the pulse of a community. Oftentimes, um, you know, people are very willing and open in sharing uh, um, their ideas or even uh, issues that they face bring it up to the front row. So this day, the smart city applications definitely have a big uh, component that involves in, uh, uh, you know, software, app-based, you know, everybody's now having a, you know, phone with us. We are very interactive with our phone. We want to reach out and we wanted to contribute. We wanted to consume um, information through that. And um, part of that is also, you know, building these systems in the back end of it using GIS technology or big data or machine learning um, type of uh, um, knowledge gathering and uh, uh, knowledge uh, gaining, if you will, uh, around these systems. Um, further, uh, we're looking at the smart city aspect from you know technology perspective and policy side, and you know combining together the ultimate goal here is to provide improved quality of uh, life for our the, the city residents. You know you. In supporting infrastructure uh, to drive one of these um, is, you know, the foundational thing, you know, for a smart city uh, application to be successful. Um, do we have the enough uh, um, bandwidth? Do we have the uh, network connectivity? Do we have uh, the uh, necessary uh, infrastructure such as, you know, cloud or whatever the uh, um, applic uh, application support infrastructure that we have? Do we have that uh, available to us? Do we have the personnel or, or the human resources to make uh, some of these uh, solutions successful? And then the, the viability of these projects, also the sustainability aspect of it is how we're gonna be conceiving these projects and uh, um, you know, putting together the elements that make these projects work and then the, uh, um, the long-term aspects of how this is gonna be deployed, maintained, um, and uh, uh, the life cycle of these projects. So how are we going to, you know, look at that? These are all the components. The important aspect about it is this is the equity side of it. You know, is this uh, smart city applications uh, designed and implemented for all? Um, oftentimes, um, um, the project's conceived one way, um, but, you know, it may or may not reach everybody. and. Uh, a thought processes needs to go into that to um, make sure that the inclusiveness is uh, a, a main and front and center component of the smart city initiatives. And then um, 
important aspect again is the governance structure. What is the administration or who makes up this and who makes the decision and uh, uh, the, uh, the, the role uh, this plays as, uh, from the leadership perspective to, to set the vision, the mission, the objectives, you know, clearly defined uh, um, outcomes for what we are looking for and then how our citizen um, pool is participating in it. The engagement is very key for one of these smart city uh, initiatives. So I'm just going to show some examples of smart city projects that are deployed all around. And uh, this is by no means any exhaustive list. This is just some things that I found it interesting to share. Um, these examples, you know, from uh, local region that where we are in and uh, across the country and then some examples on the international arena as well. Um, so one thing that we looked at is you know, transportation and mobility issues are, um, uh, are, are a main issue. If you go to any public meeting about uh, projects, issues, in, you know, transportation mobility, invariably the things come about is parking issues. Cities and uh, towns of all sizes have uh, this issue and uh, this particular example here is looking at um, parking uh, issues in, in Massachusetts across four different size, towns and cities are like similar size cities, medium, small to medium. So this is a smart thought process but not necessarily a technological solution here but you know it's a policy based uh, um, thought process looking at this is how do we manage uh, um, these parking related situation or parking related issues uh, for these cities. You know, when we have uh, an event that happens, you know, ramping up of uh, uh, requirements for parking and how do you get people in, get them to park and go to the, the events that they want and you know, get them dispersed. And so how do we do this? So what are the solutions? You know, there are um, um, options looking at, you know, you know, making the compact uh, uh, um, parking spaces available or, you know, looking at temporary parking solutions, you know, looking at, uh, um, you know, space that are available around the city, use that as uh, temporary accommodations in tech for um, a specific targeted event. And also looking at residential areas, you know, using that as a, as a spillover, a satellite parking um, um, avenue for um, handling situations like that. So this is again widespread across communities that you know tackling with issues that come about periodically um, or at um, high volume um, um, requirements. But that is a short period. But you know how do we accommodate it? So this example kind of demonstrate that. More um, from the technology side. Um, Here's an example from Wellington, New Zealand, looking at uh, you know parking and availability of parking and letting uh, um, you know putting uh, the user the availability of parking space using um, sensors deployed right at the parking space itself. You know we all know you know the downtown traffic is is contributed mainly for pe by people roaming around looking for parking spaces and in turn contributing uh, um, variety of different environmental um, uh, issues like you know um, emissions and um, pollution and all that associated. So um, in-ground parking space using sensor technology, you know, perhaps the driver is equipped with an app that communicates with the uh, sensor connected through a Wi-Fi network. Um, and then you get some indication of what parking spaces are. So again, so this is a technology solution for uh, a specific parking related issue and, uh, um, and how do you uh, um, consume it and how do you pay for it and uh, um, for uh, availing that service is integrated into perhaps an app based environment. And but off late, uh, smart, uh, smart parking technology or smart parking solutions are all around um, uh, evolving around not necessarily based on um, having sensor deployments because sensor deployments are uh, very expensive. Um, you know, so we don't know how it is going to pan out and you know, we're on 
continued um, uh, life cycle for those solutions and how much it's going to take and how widespread can you have these solutions in deployment. So there are other thought processes uh, around is like solutions depending on Wi-Fi and smartphone uh, technology. Um, so not individual sensors. So we uh, think think that you know you're in the city corridor with uh, you know public Wi-Fi and you have an app that you know connects to that public Wi-Fi and then public Wi-Fi um, uh, understand you're approaching that uh, area and then it can potentially give you indications of clusters where the parking is available. So this is kind of a, not an exact or a precise solution but are a cost effective solution. You know, participation is the key in these type of um, um, technologies. You know, if even a portion of uh, the uh, intended user base uh, adopts to these type of solutions, the, the predictiveness or the, the results of uh, the accuracy of the, uh, the solution is um, has tremendous potential. So here's an example of uh, um, Sensory deployments in Jacksonville, Florida, and San Diego, California, uh, street lamps with a sensor aggregation. So here, looking at uh, um, um, you know, using from a sensor's eyes, uh, analyzing the environment around us, and perhaps give indication of available you know, parking solutions or any other uh, um, environmental factors around it. So on the right, you have uh, um, um, sensors that are Cohabitated or co-located within the same uh, lamp post that can sense, you know, uh, your pollution levels, temperatures, localized temperatures, humidity, and and all the other factors that you would typically would like to to know. You know, if you're getting a weather report, you're getting a weather report for the city, or you know, this could more or less tailor the information to the localized conditions that we are in uh, surrounding our environment. And it also can have potential to uh, uh, play a big role in other applications. So um, there are a lot of smart city application initiatives are anchored around this lamppost. So it is offering an ideal uh, a real estate for a deployment of many smart technology-based application that, that you can interact with. And New York, similar, and we have uh, this demonstrative example of what's called a uh, talking street map. You know, this um, interacts with the pedestrians and it can uh, initiate a query with you or you can talk to the smart uh, uh, street lamp and ask directions perhaps, or, you know, uh, digital signage is displayed and it has speakers embedded uh, uh, and microphones embedded in it so you can communicate with uh, this uh, interactive sign and the uh, street lab here. Um, then also other uh, applications such as video surveillance, surveillance you know, informational kiosks, and it also you know, serves as some kind of a platform for leveraging all um, potential um, technology application that can be embedded in this. And you, you will see these scenarios repeat over and over again in many of the smart city applications um, and s slightly tailored to the local conditions that are talking local problems that we are we're trying to tackle with. And more locally here, so here's an example from the uh, Virginia Avenue smart card. So they recently released the Aerotropolis Atlanta uh, document that kind of looked at various aspects of these uh, smart uh, city solutions that can potentially play a role in uh, in the Virginia Avenue smart car. As you see here, you know you're looking at traffic lights, you're looking at uh, eliminated, you know, payment markings, roadside sensors, and you know, provision for autonomous vehicle uh, uh, implementations, and uh, uh, looking at curbs and you know, built infrastructure um, and, and so forth. So. And the chart there, right there on the top, um, uh, top left from Georgia Power, the example that we showed before are again repeating here. You can see the lamp post as an anchor and uh, a variety of technology, smart city applications are um, possible to be deployed in that immersive environment. So uh, I've talked about autonomous vehicles, you know, autonomous vehicles are here and then they, it is going to be uh, you know, very widespread and pretty soon it is in become ubiquitous. We 
we all understand that it has tremendous uh, impact on the cities in terms of how the city is going to be shaping up. And we do realize the uh, um, potential advantages of the autonomous vehicles can uh, you know offer us you know by increasing um, many estimates or many studies have sort of you know talked about how it can potentially increase in uh, um, the rights sharing habits of people you know, either by private vehicles uh, being multi-purposed or using shared autonomous vehicles um, the ride sharing and uh, you know, taking the number of vehicles that we have available uh, right now off the streets um, in turn um, because of this uh, technology solution around it is the impacts on uh, the accident footprints will definitely going to reduce it. Some estimates of the drastic reductions in upwards of 80% uh, reduction in traffic um, accidents and that turn into close to $200 billion of uh, you know, savings from property damage to uh, insurance claims. And this is according to a McKinsey study that they're estimating when uh, autonomous vehicles are um, prevalent. And parking issues for the most part um, uh, will be addressed because you know, autonomous vehicles are not going to be parked at one place and in a shared, especially shared autonomous vehicles are not going to be parked in one place. So the idea is to use the vehicle maximum uh, time. You know, currently we use our vehicle for a fraction of a day. You know, we come to work, uh, we park it, um, and then we take it in the evening and go home. So the vehicle uh, for mobility uh, is serving um, only a fraction of the time. So um, the autonomous vehicle arena, shared autonomous vehicle arena, is going to have a tremendous impact in terms of uh, parking everybody. So the potential to claim some of those spaces and maybe turn them into a, a you know a open space or a green space, whatever. It is. So cities and uh, um, towns are uh, really um, you know poised to uh, gain a lot from um, adaptation of these technologies. And in turn, it also have you know improves uh, health outcomes and quality of uh, life outcomes. You know by uh, um, reducing uh, the footprint reducing the stress levels associated with these uh, uh, you know driving vehicles and I'm sure for one like I'm pretty sure many of you would uh, would, uh, would would want to read a book or catch up to your news and uh, leave the driving to the vehicle so those days are not too far from us it is it is going to happen uh, uh, pretty soon um, soon soon 15 20 years time frame there um, so it also has the potential to have a great impact on how our current streets are designed or how, you know, what retrofitting that we have to do uh, and how are the new cities and the new streets are going to be designed. Do we still need the standard 12, 18, 24 with payments? How much of that can be reclaimed by uh, uh, claim to allocate for, you know, pedestrians and um, um, shared like, you know, um, scooters and other uh, type of mobility solution that are coming on board so how do we how do we redesign that so um, so that is in the minds of planners and architects and uh, designers and the technology implementers and as we go from there will be there will be a paradigm shift in uh, many of those uh, uh, aspects and talking about autonomous vehicle again so it's all based on sensors, right? So you have a bunch of sensors in, in the vehicle and then that sensors have to communicate with your infrastructures around. So our infrastructure have to be uh, retrofitted or uh, redesigned to accommodate these things. So you know, have this communication between vehicle to driver and vehicle to infrastructure, vehicle to other technology components that are uh, um, implemented. So this calls for a radical thinking of uh, how the cities are going to be shaping as we go forward. And this is just one of those components is the, the autonomous vehicles. The form factor we're looking at here, a bunch of uh, different autonomous vehicle implementations that are on board, some of the trials, some of them are already in uh, implementation. So you see uh, from two-seater to four-seater, eight-seater, 12-seater, so what, and some of them are even the you know, size of a bus. So um, to accommodate and uh, uh, to uh, you know create uh, uh, infrastructure uh, design for these um, 
uh, is going to be different than the way that we've been doing it before because so far uh, the roadway design everything is tailored for uh, uh, our eyes so we see and react and uh, maybe not in the distant future um, that may not be the case because if you since dependence of technology it is going to be all based on sensory of the machine so the infrastructure have to be tailored according to um, um, to the uh, evolution of these uh, different solutions that, that will be coming on board. And another important aspect on that is uh, creating uh, um, base maps, three-dimensional base maps. You know, today's uh, uh, navigation and maps and everything is based on two-dimensional, but that is not going to cut it at the, three, uh, at the autonomous vehicle arena. So it's, you know, the vehicle senses, senses things, but that is not complete. So you still need to have your built environment uh, augmenting uh, with the sensory environment within a uh, vehicle. So there's a lot of role play for the people in the GIS arena, um, you know, mapping and planning uh, um, in, in, in inventorying and asset management and uh, creating uh, 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 um, the back-end infrastructure, just like, you know, how Google Map operates now. So the back-end infrastructure to enable uh, the search uh, solutions to uh, um, work efficiently so that is a that is a big uh, um, a gap that that will be rapidly filled um, going forward so this example here is the north avenue smart car not long from here right at the edge of georgia tech and from renew uh, uh, this initiative is just uh, uh, you know, deployed as a living laboratory for the for our city here so there's uh, hundreds of sensors deployed, you know, more than, you know, do, you know, dozens and dozens of projects, individual projects are deployed on here. So it's a, it's a, it's a stretch of 2.3 mile uh, uh, street along North Avenue, um, important connection point to downtown uh, um, attractions such as, you know, Mercedes Benz Stadium to Aquarium and, you know, Coca-Cola and Georgia Tech and, you know, upstream to the Pond City Market. So it is just a cluster of you know vibrant activity of uh, um, uh, in the city and this is an ideal place for a test bed for this uh, um, technology implementation you know city of atlanta and georgia tech and you know a bunch of other partners uh, part uh, combined together is implementing this project it's just a research hub to gather and analyze data real time there's a back office operation so monitoring information that are being collected and then being uh, collated and uh, curated for um, gaining um, knowledge so that could be um, potentially used for um, uh, making policy level decisions and how we can deploy this across uh, the city in different places um, the replication strategies which work which one did not work and uh, um, Primary focus there is, uh, you know, redesigning our traffic lights and, um, you know, how autonomous vehicles can be implemented in our uh, uh, city. So this is an excellent test bed and currently, you know, generating lots and lots of data um, as we speak. And up in Peachtree Corners, so this Curiosity Lab is another interesting uh, uh, test bed for, um, all emerging smart city based applications here. It's you know, located in uh, Peachtree City, um, a city right outside of uh, the perimeter um, on a 500 acre commercial office park, um, um, driven by a 5G connectivity by from Sprint. Um, there's a mile and a half track of um, you know, autonomous vehicle track um, deployed right on the city on right away, right in the middle of the thick of things. You know, you go about your daily life, but you're right there in the test track on the city on uh, right away. Um, it just uh, it shows as an incubator to um, encourage uh, companies who are working on uh, some of these niche smart city applications or ideas uh, to come and test their ideas into the Curiosity Lab. Um, we also provide you know coaching and mentoring um, opportunities um, you know office space availability and uh, you know provide some connections to um, you know investors or um, or uh, venture capitalists so 
this is an excellent, excellent uh, facility for our uh, city to, you know, have an infrastructure such as this to increase this um, startup uh, uh, culture. And um, it is it is definitely going to produce a lot of results going forward. And uh, looking at nationally, this example here is the Smart Columbus, Columbus, Ohio. They are the winners of uh, the U.S. Department of Transportation's Smart Challenge in 2016. You know, they got about uh, $40 million uh, from the U.S. Department of Transportation. Um, in addition, they have generated close to almost $100 million to implement a variety, a suite of uh, uh, um, technology-based um, and policy-based um, uh, visioning um, for um, Columbus. And looking at the bottom tier right here, the outcomes are cutting across uh, a spectrum of uh, the city's operations. And you know, looking at uh, you know projects, looking at the connectivity of the, uh, the vehicle connectivity systems, and you know, we looked at the smart street lighting and uh, you know. Uh, infrastructure issue, you know, um, components uh, about how to avoid, you know, um, collisions, and what technology uh, aspects can be looked at from there, and uh, um, looking at uh, mobility solution from a single play, uh, payment system if you're going to switch from one mode of transportation to another, and they're also looking at some, an example of connecting um, a hospital patient scheduling with uh, transit scheduling to make sure certain outcomes are achieved. So there are a variety of uh, um, uh, technology and uh, um, citizen uh, focused applications are, are rolled into this smart city and so they're well on their way in uh, executing uh, some of these uh, projects. Um, so this is from uh, uh, Los Angeles Department of Transportation. So um, Yesterday, this particular project uh, won uh, an award from Newsweek's uh, as, well as, a, as a you know momentum shifting uh, award. Um, here is they're developing a um, mobility data specification, specifically targeting uh, these um, scooters and bikes um, that are kind of mushroomed about in the cities. You know, we see right here in the city of Atlanta. So. Um, about a year or so ago, we didn't see many of them. Now we have close to 15,000 of them flying all around the place. You know, oftentimes you may have seen it just lying across sidewalks and you know, hindering um, mobility people. You know, people who have mobility challenges, and it is mushroomed so fast. And uh, before we could think about and create policies around, um, you know, so we are kind of in a reactive situation. And this particular uh, example from LA, they have developed this. A specification that calls for how these solutions need to be deployed in the city footprint, especially when you're using the public right of way. Um, and then this specification calls for uh, certain data elements um, to be provided to the city by these providers, you know, for example, knowing exactly where they are in real time and who, what, where you, which of these vehicles are used and what the conditions of they are in. And, uh, you know, and uh, looking at uh, some information related to you know where the trips are originating, where they are ending, and so the city is collecting this data from um, these providers, and then after a curated you know you know process to eliminate and uh, get rid of personal information, and um, they make this data available to their open portal and then through APIs for the public to consume and uh, to use it on uh, or use it for other applications. So this is an excellent. Um, example of uh, um, creating um, the city-led uh, initiative to kind of get get you know grapple with the situation that is quickly coming on, and then how do we um, regulate it and you know um, create some kind of a uniform structure to uh, make things go a little easier. And this example here again going back into the technology a suite of things you know this is. The area of things at Chicago, um, the collaborative work between Oregon National Laboratory and University of Chicago and other partners in the Chicago area. And you see here, you see kind of like a pod looking thing and then has an integrated co-located sensory deployment. And um, um, 
you know, programmable modules and nodes that are, you know, potentially going to be deployed all around the city. And uh, it, it is built as a solution um, that could act as a fitness tr tracker for the city. And it's going to be um, taking on projects to measure a variety of, uh, um, you know, quality of life indicator um, that would, you know, send feedback to, um, you know, the city administrators to see how we can, uh, you know, enhance service delivery and, uh, um, you know, the final outcome, you know, obviously to impact the livability of people and increase um, the, the uh, citizens, um, what do we call, for the lack of a better word, happiness and how we live in that city. And here's an international ex example of uh, an implementation that Dubai is undertaking. So this is a complete um, uh, a life cycle based uh, um, um, smart city initiative using blockchain. You know, this particular application here is about uh, streamlining the processes of, you know, creating a business, running a business, and how to navigate the bureaucracy or the lack of. Um, and uh, facilitate the collaboration uh, at different levels of uh, the government and the, 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 the enterprise that is uh, uh, running, um, you know, provide a transparent and secure uh, uh, transaction. So, you know, blockchain, if you uh, looked at it, it's, it's basically a, an end-to-end -end closed uh, a ledger of things. So it started to finish, everything is contained into that and um, one refers to the other, meaning um, so it is sort of a foolproof uh, way of uh, record keeping. Um, you know, you cannot tamper with it. So there are examples of blockchain based um, applications uh, that are being attempted elsewhere as well. So Dubai is um, setting to power all the government services using blockchain technology by 2020. And then um, here's another example in, in India, you know, um, in, in India, the smart cities uh, mission um, from by the prime minister, uh, current prime minister is ambitiously aiming to develop 100 cities um, from moving from where they are into what we call smart cities arena. Smart cities arena, in this case, not necessarily technology uh, heavy uh, initiatives, but making things things uh, smarter by delivering services to people, um, taking stock of the inventory of things, bringing uh, data uh, elements into governance and, uh, um, and uh, reaching out to gaps where, and identifying and finding out gaps where uh, things are. And uh, so there's a lot of uh, um, budget resources that have been allocated and close to Seven billion dollars have been uh, allocated at the federal level in the city for many of these smart city applications. A lot of them would be like large infrastructure type projects, but um, and a portion of it will be um, in the technology base. Area. So this particular example is one of the cities called city called Bhubaneswar. It is in the eastern uh, Indian city uh, state of Orissa, um, and they have submitted on a proposal um, to. Uh, for the smart cities uh, challenge. Um, and uh, this is a citizens connect initiative. And um, you know, the city has more than 1 million people. It is for Indian standard. It is not a mega city, but it is a city uh, for that state that is like a large population and it's rapidly urbanizing, urban, uh, rapidly urban um, environments. Um, and you know the, the issues around um, typical of any other big city in, in, in a developing country. So this initiative um, aims to address many of that, you know, using technology for um, to reach and find the gaps that they are looking for and um, you know, engage the citizens is the main focus of this particular uh, initiative. And in their plan uh, proposal aspect of it they've included and they've engaged the citizens to the maximum and that was one of those um, things that have been highlighted for their recognition by APA in the international categories. This plan also calls for developing about close to thousand acres around the, uh, the, the, the city to you know create uh, a 24 by 7 living um, um, living workplace type of environment in the city of Bhubaneswar. 
And this is an example of a you know, graduate studio class that I co-taught with one of our faculty members this past spring. Um, the city of Varanasi in India uh, is an important cultural um, landmark. Uh, this is one of the um, oldest, uh, you know, continually inhabited cities uh, in the world, and it is a seat of uh, of the religion of in the Hindu and uh, Hinduism, and as well as Buddhism. So it's a, it's a very um, a significant place. But the, Varanasi is one of those cities in the Prime Minister's uh, uh, Smart City initiatives. So this city, you know, think about 5,000 years has been in existence, and then the city grew from organic, you know, it grew to what it is today. And uh, so we had a group of uh, graduate students in our class, and we collaborated with uh, uh, the Indian Institute of Technology in, uh, in Karakpur and Bowen, uh, um, Indian Institute of Technology in, uh, in Varanasi. Um, we did this study to look at their ambitions in becoming uh, a smart city. What are the current conditions? So we had this method identified three areas right here. We look at it in one uh, around the Ganges River um, and where the, um, what we call them, the guard section. The guards are like the steps leading into the water. So it's a very sacred place there. Um, and how, um, you know, the current state of what, where things are. In, in several years, uh, um, they've made a lot of improvements in uh, making uh, these guards uh, more connected and, um, and you know, cleaned up the place. And so our study kind of looked at these three areas from three different perspectives, you know, from a trans tourism perspective and a transportation perspective and an environment perspective. So we did right, you know, field uh, investigation for all three areas from all three perspectives during the week that we were there and um, um, inventory and documented um, um, the issues that we do, that we saw, and we talked to uh, people who are on the field, and talked to business owners, talked to people who are visiting, and uh, so to get a true sense of where the city is at this uh, time, and what people think about the smart city ambitions of the city. So it's interesting to note that several uh, comments from uh, you know people um, come about from you know pointing out basic needs of you know give us clean water you know fix our portals and fix our lighting so those are just foundational issues that big cities and urban cities face so those are you know uh, really um, uh, fundamental things that needs to be taken care of you know smart city is not going to be addressing those type of issues it has to be beyond that and but those real issues are should be the focus for cities to you know first address and then comes the layer of smart city ambition so we made a bunch of recommendations uh, to teach it on the Sarnath area is the uh, uh, you know seat of the uh, philosophy of Buddhism um, you know Buddhism kind of originated from there um, crossed across to uh, other parts of the Asia yeah and here is an example of uh, uh, some of the uh, projects that we do here at the campus, and I manage this uh, project here, what we call Smart Trees. What it is is uh, in our 400-acre campus footprint, you know, how we manage our urban forestry, and um, you know, the, the you know our strategic plan calls for a certain percentage of canopy cover within the uh, you know campus footprint, and we have this project um, that tracks. Uh, the canopy coverage, the progression of it, and because our campus has gone through tremendous change in the last 20 years, and you know, built up square footage is you know doubled in size, enrollment doubled in size, but um, at the same token, the, um, the 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 nature of the you know, sustainability actions that we've taken has really reduced a lot of uh, indicators in terms of you know carbon footprints and you know water uh, usage from municipal sources is all actually reduced. So in this project, we are able to keep track of them. You know, the, we know what the distribution of our species is, and you know the condition of it. You know, every month we report to a committee that that meets, and um, we use it for our planning purposes. We use it for operational issues, and we also know what the net effect of our campus footprint in terms of you know rainwater 
harvestation or carbon sequestration or carbon storage and uh, you know air quality measures so uh, this data is being used for uh, by many different applications you know one of those sort of applications is a is an urban localized microclimate study by our urban uh, um, eco uh, uh, um, research group in the College of Design. So this is a um, this is a unique project. You know, you 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 will not find many of these projects. If not, I would say it's very rare to find a project like this that are continually updated an inventory of uh, your urban forests and that is calibrated against your strategic uh, initiatives. Uh, of, of our institute. So I just wanted to focus or uh, talk about the Georgia Smart project. So Georgia Smart uh, projects uh, is an initiative um, uh, through the Georgia uh, uh, Community Challenge. So it is a project aimed to empower uh, local governments uh, within the state by encouraging them to innovate and integrate data and smart city technologies into their operations to improve overall quality of life. So um, there are two cohorts of projects, the one that's completed, uh, four cities across the state, uh, one uh, a competitive challenge, and, and the second group of uh, projects are just coming on board for this current year, 2018 and 19. So this one is a project in the city of Albany, right in the south side of the state, and they have uh, developed and housing data analytics and visualization um, kind of a dashboard to uh, make um, uh, and evaluate evaluate uh, um, um, the data about their housing and you know, making it available to the public through open data portal. And uh, out in the east or coast here, Chatham County, where Savannah is, in the big port operation, the big economic uh, uh, engine for our state. And here, a uh, sea level is a uh, sea level rise is an issue, and um, um, this particular project uh, is developing uh, a pilot sensory network to measure sea level rise and to inform uh, uh, um, for government officials to and stakeholders in real time doing natural disasters. And we have already, I think, this is the, the pilot study has already tested it in the recent uh, uh, event that happened in a couple of months ago. And the city of Chambly is looking at uh, shared autonomous vehicles and, uh, you know, looking at the first mile, last mile, you know, connection in relation to the MARTA station in the city of Chambly. This is right in the city of Atlanta. And um, on the west along the Alabama border, there was city of Columbus, an important city as a big economic engine. You have, you know, big manufacturing plants, automobile industries anchored around uh, um, um, you know, uh, Columbus, and uh, they're developing smart technologies for their uptown districts, you know, safety and security being the primary focus of this um, um, project and, and you know, collection, collection and curating and sharing of the, you know, in the data through uh, this effort is also part of this initiative. And Macon Bay County is uh, uh, this current cohort, and they are looking at deploying um, smart kiosks across the city to, um, uh, you know, uh, for uh, citizen engagement um, using weight finding and other information that, that needs to be disseminated through uh, these kiosks. And right here in Atlanta, or Milton, uh, city of Milton is going to look at the, the um, uh, aspect of uh, um, getting kids to school um, with the walkability of it and, and uh, giving information to parents in real time um, uh, about um, uh, through an app based uh, uh, initiative for uh, targeting children and access to schools um, for uh, walkability. And uh, I'll be working with the city of uh, Woodstock in um, developing a uh, you know strategy around uh, um, you know smart technologies and you know I'll just study. Uh, the downtown corridor where a Main Street and um, uh, Arnold Greenville Parkway join and uh, Town Lake Parkway. So this is Woodstock is a vibrant city. It's very fast growing, and it's a it's a um, you know walkable city and it's a very um, vibrant um, community engagement and uh, you know you know a lot of activities that happen throughout the city. Big events happen. So transportation 
and mobility issues are front and center for uh, the city of Woodstock. So through the study, we are aiming to learn and understand and identify um, some projects to be implemented um, as, as pilot studies and then take it from there. So this slide kind of summarizes, you know, people are, you know, it's proven that urban digital, you know, that, uh, sorry, improved um, digital technologies uh, definitely influence urban, uh, you know, development, you know. Um, people are willing to uh, uh, provide information. People are willing to get on board with these initiatives. Um, and provided there are, there are, uh, Clearly communicated and uh, um, understood, and uh, they, you know, they are um, not averse to, uh, um, you know, adapting to these technologies and adapting to these solutions that are coming on board. You know, this particular study talked to, to interview 2,000 people across the world, business executives, and they come to this conclusion about technologies definitely is influencing how these urban uh, a, environments are evolving um, and how they are actively participating in that, in that process. And some of the challenges for uh, smart city initiatives going forward for implementation, you know, this is issues are, you know, readily relatable, you know, how sustainable are these projects that we are going to take on? Uh, is it a short term uh, um, project or is it on a long term basis? You know, how is going to be staged? And uh, um, taking the project beyond pilot studies and scaling it to fit to a larger framework or, you know, citywide deployments are all often very challenging. And then the cost associated with that and the funding scenarios or the different funding models will that be sustained over the period. So that are all going to be challenges. And then technology, the big pitfalls with technologies is that the life cycle is so short and it's so rapidly advancing and investments investments made on these technology solutions could quickly become out, out of dated and then, then you have to re-up for it. Maybe the, you know, the operating uh, you know, platform change, the interoperability nature changed and you know, the new uh, you know, specification is coming about. So there's gonna be a constant catch up to this um, uh, technology cycle. And then consensus building in our governance uh, is uh, another thing. You know, how do we keep the coalitions together? Um, and there's also going to be, uh, you know, um, there's going to be some impacts, unintended consequences, the column. Um, so it might disrupt uh, existing social and economic inequalities uh, for, um, for um, hopefully for the better, but it could be for the worse as well. You know, the resiliency aspects of this um, smart city initiatives from between the stakeholders is also are going to be a challenge. So applying all that, you know, big data is going to drive the smart city applications and big data comes with its own challenges. So what's this data, the volume of data that we're going to be dealing with, how are we going to be storing it, who's going to be storing it, where is it going to be stored, what kind of a security measures that we have seen, you know, You've seen uh, in the in the, recent, the last six months or so, you know, um, data breaches for local and city governments, you know, taken for ransom. Um, you know, cities have to pay money to get out of that. And, you know, these are going to be real issues. And you know, the more we are getting over into these technology solutions, that is a real, real issue that we need to be uh, paying a lot of attention attention to. And this is a summary of a book um, from Ambas Bursma. And here in this is kind of uh, raising 12 different uh, factors that could derail a smart city project. So there's, a, there's an excellent read and uh, he raises a lot of questions on what can really throw uh, a, a smart city ambition off course. And I'm not gonna read all of this. And as you see here, you know, the, you know, smart city, the notion of smart city itself is debatable. What uh, really makes that it's all primarily focused on technology or what other thought process, you know, is it like um, coming up with a policy based? And so that debate is going to be uh, definitely discussed more. And, you know, technology issues, you know, and solutions and solutions isn't like, you know, we oftentimes we find a, a smart city project and then we, we try to come up 
with a solution, but is the solution really aligning with the objectives of the success? So that is one thing that is is is, is questioned there, and objective or lack thereof could uh, could also be a factor in uh, determining um, how the smart cities uh, projects uh, evolve. So siloed implementation, so that is a real issue. So we were taking a uh, one particular uh, group or one particular department in a city has ambitious ideas driven and they drive uh, uh, these implementations and um, perhaps not in the best interest of the you know, overall environment and uh, you know that how do we iron that now you know that is definitely going to be uh, an uh, a factor in how these the projects are deployed. So, and some of these things I like to hear all technology based. You know, you're close to architecture. So, you know, the solution that you're adapting to it is it a vendor specific solution? Is uh, if it is, what happens if the vendor or those particular provider is no longer there? And how do we move on from there? So. Um, are there open architectures or open systems so that the interoperability is mature? So the, those are also going to play a role in, in how a, the smart city projects kind of uh, evolve around it. You know, legacy IT suboptimal networks is smart city is data hungry and it also bandwidth hungry. So that does your city measure up to it? Is the underlying foundational infrastructure is up to date for these, and so perhaps that needs to be the first step in in um, in looking at the smart city ambitions. And um, we talked about this digital divides and lack of community, communi you know, the communication being and engaging your uh, stakeholders and your citizen in that process and bring everybody on board and. Uh, um, uh, attempt to uh, not leave anybody behind in this process is, uh, is going to be a factor as well. And then the scaling aspect of it. Um, so this is just, just a good summary of uh, um, what some of these impediments for this project is about. And there's also a lot of backlash for smart city applications. You know, you're looking at uh, several examples. I'm just saying one here, here. Um, you know, there's local level resistances, uh, resistances by smart, you know, for smart city applications or programs. You know, you know, there are perceived notions. You know, um, whether it is proven or so, but um, like private agencies are, you know, often technology providers are driving the uh, initiative and and what is the profit motive beyond what is a stated and obvious goals. So the example here is. Uh, you know, Toronto's waterfront urban innovation project called Quasi. This uh, by the City Labs is an F, kind of like an affiliated entity with uh, Google and uh, Alphabet. Um, it was all uh, uh, um, good, well intentioned, but uh, digging deeper, people are realizing that there are other ulterior motives in, in that initiative, and there's going to be a lot of backlash uh, related to that is still being played out right now. And cities also have outright banned, uh, you know, technology components um, based purely because it's not accurate. Um, um, you know, they're not, they don't believe in it, and uh, they've banned some technology as well. And then this pervasive in, you know, invasion of these technology into everyday life, um, um, into you know, your city governance is also going to be an issue that that's going to be pushbacks and. If there are some poster child things happen, and that is going to cause a lot of um, uh, anxiety, and people are um, um, going to be not engaged that much. Um, so that is going to be a real, real uh, concern as well. So this stealth data collection is uh, an aspect that you know we are all being harvested from head to toe by everybody. You know, with the, because we voluntarily provide information to the apps that we deal with in the technology solution I, again are going to have some type of interactive nature with it and then you have to get give up uh, information on it so that is going to be a, a big problem and that the backlashes are going to be around that for sure so in summary um, you know cities um, have their ambition, they have their vision, they have uh, their objectives. So the smart city needs to be defined based on those objectives. So 
and it needs to you know closely align with those objectives that are set set for and in building and and a nurturing partnership again among stakeholders from you know administration as to political will to you know citizenry and you know private players are going to be uh, a key aspect of it um, coordinated efforts coordinated uh, initiatives will probably have more opportunity to succeed than being in uh, you know pillar environments by themselves mm -hmm. And then what are the metrics and how are we going to measure the success of this, this uh, initiative? So that needs to be clearly thought to and uh, calibrated along the way. And then at the end of the day, uh, it has to be uh, critically looked at to see if it achieved the results that we were looking for at the end of the day. You know, technology implementation are all nice and shiny and bright and don't want to make noise, but did it really yield the result that we were looking for? So that has to be looked through. Uh, at the end of it. And then uh, cities also need to push the envelope a little bit and you know, think outside the box and uh, um, uh, take a uh, take on this cutting edge thing that is coming by and board. Maybe there is maximum benefit from it uh, for uh, as an early adopter. Um, so that is something they need to be looking at that as well. And there's organizational or governance issues. Um, that you know any kind of uh, misgivings there that needs to be recognized very early on in the process and uh, needs to be worked out uh, pretty uh, pretty well. So just to conclude, um, you know the cities are ambitious to envision and implement a smart city solutions. You know they don't have to start from scratch. You know we've seen several examples here, and there are some common themes that go across. You know the technology is playing a vital and a dominant role in many of the smart city applications, but um, you don't have to research and find, but you can rely on uh, rely on a solution that was uh, uh, deployed and it worked. And um, you can take that from there and then kind of tailor that for uh, uh, the, each individual city's uh, um, experience. Um, um, then um, digitization is going to be ubiquitous. You know, we've seen that uh, in the last 10, 20, 10, 15 years with the advent of, uh, you know, 5G now coming on board and then data uh, going back and forth, the bits uh, spreading across will be, will be just uh, mind boggling. So um, it is going to be fat, data fat applications um, and uh, it's going to be everywhere and uh, cities have to uh, kind of get on board with it and you know failure to not fully embracing it is going to be uh, and not an option for them so to say that you know you lead be in the forefront of it or you follow proven examples or the cities are definitely poised for decline because uh, the quality of life will suffer because citizens are going to be looking to see why our city is not doing something that the other uh, uh, cities are doing and you know we are going you know there is no boundaries between city to a city you know we go from one place to another and we experience one type of environment and we see the ease of uh, you know governance or we, we see applications that are you know implemented to engage the citizens and we come back into your environment and if you don't see that people are going to be demanding and uh, so that the smart city initiatives are going to be mandatory for uh, most cities. So with that, thank you. And uh, I'd like to take any questions if we have. Uh, Greg, Thanks so I much, Steve. To you. That, was, that was an incredible discussion of smart cities technologies and, and the types of applications that are out there within our state and really just around the world. So thank you, thank you for that. Um, we realize we're a little bit over time, but we do, for those of you who do want to submit a few questions, we will take them now. Um, so, so please use the chat area to submit written questions. Um, I'll ask from your uh, overview that you've that you've done of, of smart cities projects. Is there any one or a group of projects that stand out to you as really good projects that that make a difference, that make an impact? So there are there are some low hanging kind of projects that yield a lot of benefits. We've seen that those type of applications are all in like in a tweaking things, for example, 
um, I, um, you were in that meeting at the uh, uh, City of Woodstock Transportation Summit. They talked about some fine tuning of existing infrastructure to make it clearly, you know, visible. For example, lane markings, you know, uh, curb alignments from infrastructure, very small investments, and that provide tangible benefits. So this is not exactly a technology implementation, but you can see retrofitting and then making, you know, uh, your understanding of how these things work and you, by making minor modifications, you get definite benefits. On the technology side, you know, obviously open data, open data is a big, big initiative and community is successful if they are open and if they make information available to their citizen and the businesses and other stakeholders because the derivative side of things is enormous because you democratize information and then if I am a provider and I have a nice idea that I'm thinking to but I depend on the data from the city for example and I'm now in a position to create a solution that can significantly impact a, a aspect of it or many aspects of it. So um, um, open data is a big thing. And then we talk about uh, smart city initiative. The example that we quoted in the study that uh, mobility data specification from uh, Los Angeles Department of Transportation, excellent example there. You're aggregating data from you got it, your sources and are you being the regulator, you have certain expectation from these players and you, you bring that information in and then you do your diligence of making sure the information is, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, formatted in a way perhaps or maybe cleansed in a way, you know, um, you know keeping privacy and other things and then in turn, turn it back and make that available for the general constituents and that could be used everywhere else for other applications. Great, great. Well, thanks, Eva. Uh, I'm not seeing any additional written questions in, so that's going to be a wrap for today's webinar. We really appreciate everyone for tuning in. And again, we'll have additional webinars in the future. Please check our website for those scheduled events. Thank you all out here. Thank you.